Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is a 6414 vacuum tube that I ordered from Manly that we'll use to try to fix the de-esser. You probably won't be able to see it on the camera, but the filament of the tube on the left is glowing and the tube on the right is not. And the way the Vox box is set up, the tube on the left is part of the main preamp circuitry, which is what I've been using for several months now. And I haven't been using the de-esser because this tube has been burnt out. This particular tube was made by Raytheon. There, I turned off some of the lights, so now you can see the tube on the left is glowing and the tube on the right is now also glowing. Okay, so let's test it. I'm going to make a s sound and then see what it sounds like switching it in and out of the circuit. Okay, so let's see how that works. Hopefully we'll now have less trouble with sibilance now that our de-esser is working. Okay, let's get back to talking about tubes and guitar amplifiers. Although I should mention that everything I've talked about this semester in terms of tubes and guitar amps also applies to studio gear like the Manly Vox Box I just showed you. In the last lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we talked about how putting a capacitor across the resistor that connects the plate to the power supply in a common cathode amplifier stage has a low-pass filtering effect. In this lecture, we'll look at another low-pass filter effect, but one comes from the parasitic capacitances within the tube itself instead of a capacitor we've deliberately added. So we're once again talking about the common cathode amplifier. Here, I'm going to assume that the cathode resistance is completely bypassed. If you have a case of the cathode being partially bypassed or not bypassed at all, you can do a variation of the analysis that I'm about to show you that's more complicated, but we're really going for a back of the envelope kind of calculations here, so this is a reasonable assumption for what I need here. And notice I haven't put in any details about how this is coupled to the next amplification stage. It could be DC coupled, it could be AC coupled with a coupling capacitor, this could be a heavy load, it could be a light load. Whatever it is, you could take that load and combine it with the load resistor here, RL, by taking those two resistances in parallel. Again, those details aren't very important for what I need to talk about today. RG is the standard grid leak resistor, and RGS is something new, at least as far as the kind of schematics I've been putting into PowerPoint goes. RGS is something called a grid stopper resistor. Now, you've seen these in the real amp schematics that I've shown you previously, but I've always just hand waved grid stopper resistors away by saying, well, no current is flowing through the grid, so there's no current flowing through this resistor, so let's just pretend it's not there. We can't pretend anymore. And for the analysis I'm going to do in this lecture, I'm going to assume that this is a perfect voltage source. I'll come back to that point a little bit later. So as far as this lecture goes, I'm going to ignore the grid leak resistor. Now remember the grid, plate, and cathode of a tube are made of bits of metal. And when you have bits of metal near each other, you have capacitors. They may be tiny capacitors, but they're there. So we're going to introduce CGP that represents the parasitic capacitance between the grid and the plate. and CGK that represents the parasitic capacitance between the grid and the cathode. There is also a parasitic capacitance between the plate and the cathode, but it's not really relevant for what I want to talk about here, so I'm not going to worry about it. Now, this cathode capacitor is huge, and for the high frequencies that we're going to be focusing on, we can reasonably assume that this is acting as a short circuit, so RK is fully bypassed. So, I can just replace this connection at the cathode here with ground, leaving us with something that looks fairly complicated to analyze. So this common cathode stage is providing a gain of A, which in our notation is a negative number, and it's a pretty big number in terms of its magnitude. And this is basically providing negative feedback from the output to the input 
through this capacitor. And remember that negative feedback reduces gain. By the nature of capacitors, they prefer to pass higher frequencies. This means you have higher frequencies being fed back more than lower frequencies, which means we have effectively lower total gain at the higher frequencies. So this is acting as a low-pass filter. In general, feedback amplifiers can be fairly difficult to analyze. Fortunately here, Miller's theorem comes to the rescue, and the theorem tells us that we can take this capacitance in the feedback loop and replace it with a capacitance to ground at the input. I've labeled this CM. This is called the Miller capacitance, and it consists of the original capacitance in the feedback loop times a factor that is 1 plus the absolute value of the gain of the amplifier. Now, most textbooks don't have the magnitude bars here because they let A be positive regardless of whether the amplifier is inverting or non-inverting. In this class, I've used the convention that A is negative for inverting amplifiers like the common cathode stage, so I put the bars there to make sure this formula works no matter what convention you're using. If you would like to learn more about Miller's theorem and you're a Georgia Tech student, I recommend taking ECE 3400. I'm not going to get into the proof of the theorem for this particular class, but I will mention that as a quick sanity check, in case you're wondering about why we have 1 in this 1 plus A, think for a second about the extreme case of A equals 0, where there's no amplification. That's basically equivalent to grounding the output here. So then it would just look like you have C, G, P going to ground. So this formula matches up. So it's easy enough to combine these parallel capacitances. We just add them, and we wind up with something that looks just like a one-pole low-pass RC filter. Now usually CGK and CGP are on the same order, but this multiplication by one plus the gain means that this grid-to-plate capacitance effectively looks much bigger than it is. This is something we get from the gain in a common cathode stage. It's not something we would need to worry about so much in the common grid or common plate, aka cathode follower amplifier configurations. So let's look at an example. I've generally used the first preamp stage of the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier as my go-to object of study, but there's no grid stopper resistor here, so we can't talk about that. There is a grid stopper associated with the second stage, but it uses a different load resistance than what I've used in the analyses that we've done previously. So I don't want to have to do another load line, grid line analysis, yada, yada, yada. So what about stage four here? Well, all of the values in terms of the resistances are the same as the first stage. And let me just go ahead and say that because we're assuming that we're looking at the fully bypass case, I'm going to assume this light dependent resistor is switched to act as a closed circuit so that the cathode resistance is completely bypassed. This is the higher gain setting of the Mesa Boogie. And we have this 220K grid stopper resistor here. So it looks like this would be good to analyze. But I should confess I'm cheating a little bit. I'm just going to take the gain value that we computed in a much earlier lecture and use that here as if it's correct. And I know it's not. You can already tell something weird is going on by the fact that we have 213 volts here and 200 volts marked here in terms of test points on the schematic. And that's not surprising because these stages are used in different ways. The first stage is AC coupled to all of this mess here. And this fourth stage is actually DC coupled to a cathode follower. And that does all sorts of weird stuff that I don't really totally understand myself. That's something we looked at in a previous lecture. But for the purposes of this particular lecture, I just want to get something vaguely in the ballpark that seems plausible. So let's take a look at the 12AX7 data sheet and look for those capacitances. Ah, let's assume we're using the shield. The grid to plate capacitance is 1.7 micromacrofarads, which is 1.7 picofarad. What it calls the input capacitance, that's actually the grid to cathode capacitance, and that's 1.8 picofarad.
Okay, so plugging in those values for our grid to cathode capacitance and our grid to plate capacitance, we see that the second term completely swamps the first term. And this is typical, so a lot of the time people will just not bother with the grid to cathode capacitance. This value of 75.34 for the magnitude of the gain is something I computed in a previous lecture under a different set of assumptions than is really valid for that fourth preamplifier stage, but I'm just using this as a rough guess. Anyway, adding that up, multiplying the result by our 220 kilo ohm grid stopper resistance, Taking the reciprocal of that and dividing by 2 pi gives me a cutoff frequency of 5.4 kilohertz. Now, that's kind of low. That unusually low cutoff frequency is a result of this unusually high grid stopper resistor value. I think there may be some intentional rolling off the highs here because this third stage is a cold clipper. This is a sort of stage that's meant to provide distortion more than it provides gain per se. We looked at this in a previous lecture. So that distortion is going to create all kinds of crazy harmonics that maybe the attenuation as a result of the Miller capacitance moves out. Compare the Mesa Boogie design with the Fender Deluxe. The Fender Deluxe has multiple inputs, but that's not the important part here. We have a one mega ohm grid leak resistor and a 68 kilo ohm grid stopper resistance, which is a lot lower than that 220K. So amplifiers like this will have a cutoff frequency that's outside of the audio range. And this is helpful for reducing radio frequency interference and also reduce the risk of parasitic oscillations crashing the party. Before we close out, I wanted to mention that Miller's theorem is not just applicable to vacuum tubes. It also applies to circuits with transistors.